So, we have a question today as a title. Are you ready for it? Okay, okay. Who is Jesus? Now, everyone's like mumbling over here. All right, let, let's, let's just talk about this for a minute. Go ahead. The Messiah, the Son of God. Lamb of God. King of Kings. The great I am. Alpha Omega. Son of Man. Everything. Lord and Savior. I'm reading lips now because, you know, all the words going around. Alpha and Omega. Beginning and the end. Okay. This past Wednesday, I asked my youth group this question. I had pieces of paper out on the table, and I gave them each a pencil, and I said, I'd like for you to write everything you know about Jesus on these pieces of paper. Do you think they filled the paper? <laughs> Faith, she's like, I did, I did. <laughs> Faith was still right, and I had to stop her. <laughs> Both sides. These kids know who Jesus is. Amen. They know who sustains them. Do we know who Jesus is? Do we really know who Jesus is? And so today, I want to share with you something that I shared with Pastor Bob this week. I actually emailed it to him. I was so excited about it when I found it. There's so many like little nuggets in this. And I sent it to him, and I said, oh, you know, here, check out this website. And he sends me a note back and says, oh, I'm going to make a copy of this, and we're going to teach it to the men's Sunday school. And about five or ten minutes later, he sends me an email back and says, will you bring it on Sunday? <laughs> so I'm like, yes, yes, this is exciting. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, and this is on the website. It's called ChristianAnswers.net. And I'm not just going to stand up here and rehash something that someone else already got, but I do have a couple of little points that these people made that I want to make very open to you directly from what I read. So do you believe that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Yes. Now, how do you know he was? Have you seen his birth certificate? Well, well, how do you know the Bible's real? It was written by people, right? Well, we believe it was the inspiration of God, but what about Mr. Joe Smith that just walked through the door? Does he know? How you... How... Many things that have happened that can be evidential proof of the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So let's go on here. What if this person's not really convinced that this happened 2,000 years ago, right? What are the odds that Jesus would actually be pro prophesied and his birth would be fulfilled and all these other things? To begin with, if you read through scripture, a lot of times we'll read through, you know, different things and we're like, oh, you know, this is Old Testament, let's move on or whatever. Well, the Old Testament is what they refer to as the seed plot of the Bible. It is where all the seeds were planted. And then when you look at the New Testament, you have the fulfillment of those things that were promised in the Old Testament. And we see things that were promised in the Old Testament coming true even today. Left and right, left and right, and we're like, whoa, blown out of the water for these things. The prophet Micah, in about 700 B.C., received a word from God, and he declared that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. At the same time, in a totally different area, Isaiah receives a word as well that he will be born of a virgin, Mary. Two prophets who prophesied during the same era in two different locations prophesying about the coming Messiah. Now, when you just read through the Bible, you would not know that Micah and Isaiah were actually contemporaries of one another, that they were alive during the same time, but they both were prophesying about the same coming Messiah. Pretty cool, huh? There was a prophecy in about... 1012 B.C. by King David in Psalms 22:16, that actually 
specified how the Messiah would die with the piercing of his hands and his feet, talking about death by crucifixion. 800 years before the Romans even came up with that kind of a death. That's just a little bit. All right. Malachi, another prophet, he said in about 425 B.C., he specified that the Messiah would live at the same time as the temple in Jerusalem, a temple that was destroyed in 70 A.D. and has never been rebuilt. Another prophecy. Well, if this doesn't impress you at all, when you look in Zechariah, written over 500 years before Jesus was even born, you can read about Judas receiving the 30 pieces of silver and how that silver was actually used to buy a potter's field. The very same story 500 years before Jesus was even born was told in the book of Matthew in its entirety as to what actually occurred that day. Pretty awesome. This is something, uh, let me just rewind here because I've got like 30,000 things running through my head right now. I'm so excited. Um, went to the library the other day and picked this up. Forensic Faith. Forensic Faith. It's by J. Warner Wallace. I also have not read this one yet. Jesus on Trial by David Limbaugh. Well, in this Forensic Faith, we're going to read a couple of things of what they said. But let me just say this. The person, the website with Christian Answers, they say, one March, several years ago, they received a paper from a United States Senate Chaplain Richard Halverson, and in it he wrote this. The fact is, the birth, crucifixion, and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ are celebrated worldwide by folks of every race, every language, and color every year. And we're coming up on Easter, and this is a time where I feel like we need to remind ourselves of what Jesus actually did for us. And believing in Jesus, they have been delivered from the most evil, disastrous, frustrating, debilitating habits and life forms possible. Just by believing in him. The real problem with Jesus Christ is not that folks can't believe in him, but that they won't. They refuse to. And then he says this, My friend, in all honesty, what are the chances you've not been altogether objective about the nature of that baby that was born in Bethlehem? What if that baby was really God? What if you would submit your life to him right now? There is a long line of people who have been set free, delivered from sin, from alcoholism, from drug addiction, from the anxiety of the attacks of the enemy. Raise your hand if you're one of those people. Are you set free? Yes. I mean truly 100%. You're like, that stuff is not even a thought anymore. Because Jesus died for you because he loves you. And so many of us, we run into people on a daily basis. You know Mr. Joe Smith. He walks in and he's like, ah, pff, you know, Jesus this, Jesus that. And we're like wanting to explain to him, look, you don't understand. He set me free. Well, I don't need that kind of a God. I'm happy. Oh, you really think you're happy, right? And they party until they're dead. And then they never take the time to really know who Jesus is. Because they don't think they need a God. But all we are required to do is to be the light to these folks. They may have the perfect life in their own mind, but they run across Pastor Bob and Susan at Golden Corral, bright and cheery, passing out their, their little camel jokes. <laughs> How do you hide a camel in the desert? And they're like, wait a minute. They're pretty bold, walk up to my table while I'm eating my food. But they still laugh 
and they still enjoy. And then they look and they say, oh, there's a website. I'm going to be a creeper and find out who they really are. And so they go on the internet, and they look up these messages, and in the quiet of their home, they're hearing the Word of God coming forth, and it changes their heart. And they may never know the effects of what putting themselves down and not worrying about what everybody else says, but they took that moment, and that one moment has changed a life forever. We never know. Just like the Bible planted all those seeds in the Old Testament, and then later on down the road, life and fulfillment. We are to plant seeds every way, everywhere we go, every day. And we may never see the fulfillment. We may die like those prophets of old did and never see it. But it will happen. God's word will not return void. It will not return void. So, again, we're going back to a little bit of this uh, statistical stuff. Are you ready for this? I'm all about statistics. Very cool. Some Bible scholars suggest that there's more than 300 prophetic words about Jesus, about, you know, in the Old Testament, prof prophesying his coming and all the things about his life. There's circumstances such as his birthplace, his lineage, who would be the son of, you know, the king, the line of the king of David and all that, the method of his execution, and all these things were prophesied. The chances of this happening, they say, is about 1 to the 10th in the 17th power. Does anyone in here have a clue what that means? All right, let me just, let me just break this down for you. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but Jonathan, you know the 10 to the 17th power. How many zeros do you think are on the end of that? A lot. So, let's see. There's about 24 inches right there. 24 inches. Oh, above my knee. All right, you ready for this? Everybody can see that. This is 24 inches from here to here. Suppose we took 10 to the 17th of silver dollars. I like silver dollars. I actually called the bank to see if they had a, a load of them that I could go and get. Honestly, I was like, I've got $500. I can go buy these things and put them here and just show every, you know, what it looks like. They said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but we might have two or three. We don't have 500 silver dollars. And you take these wonderful silver dollars and you cover the entire state of Texas in 24 inches of silver dollars. The entire state. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to Texas. Ain't nothing bigger than Texas. Well, you're right, Alaska is. Thank you, Mr. Frank. In my planet, I've not been to Alaska yet, so when I get there, I will say Alaska is the bigger. You are right. So fill it up all the way up to here in silver dollars. Now you've got your 10 to the 17th. Then you take a mark, a marker, and you mark one of those, and you mix it up in that batch. Then you blindfold a man, and you tell him to go out and find that one silver dollar. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Just that same chance that prophets would have had of writing just eight prophecies. Only eight prophecies. And having them all come true about one man from their day to the present time all the people that were born and died, only eight prophecies. That's the chances of that really happening. Wow. But they only used their own wisdom when they were writing scripture. Take that, Mr. Joe Smith. How, how, how could that be? Only by divine appointment. 
only by divinely writing under the inspiration of God himself who created the heavens and earth could anybody ever do that ever ever okay so I thought okay eight prophecies just just the eight major prophecies well I've got this wonderful Holman book of Bible charts I love my book some of you actually have copies of this in the big binder that I taught on a walk through the word many years ago and I thought I wonder how many they list in here and so I opened it and I thought wow that's some little little writing and I think I counted maybe a hundred and ten prophecies in here you guys can pass it around if you'd like to look at it but that's on 57 and 58 of that book and I thought now what are the chances of that happening only eight prophecies, we're going to fill it up to my knees. What about that many? So then I said, I'm going to go onto the computer and I'm going to dig this thing out. You know me. Wow. And they actually had a website that listed as many as they could possibly find in the Old Testament. Who has that kind of time? <laughs> but they did. And they started in the book of Genesis, and they went all the way through the Old Testament, Malachi, and they have 355 prophecies. Not only the Old Testament reference, but they had the New Testament, this one's yours, they had the New Testament fulfillment of the prophecies, 300 and some odd prophecies, that came to pass. Now remember, we were only talking about eight prophecies. And now we have 300 and some prophecies. Oh, but I don't believe in Jesus. What? Okay. All right, well, okay. Moving right along. There is so much information on our planet about who Jesus is, that we have no excuse not to know who he is. We can know him with our intellect, study, study, read through books, go on the internet, but that's not where it's all at. Do you know him with your spirit, man? We're all created in the image of God. We're all created in his image. We are three-part being. We don't just have this flesh that we can go study, study, and knowledge, knowledge, and fill ourselves up. We also have our human spirit on the inside that longs for the connection with God, the one who created us. That part of us will never be satisfied. We'll be out there doing everything under the sun, trying to fill that void, trying to make ourselves happy and never find it until we get on our face and say, God, if you're real, make yourself known because I need something more than what I've got. And most of the time, that's where a lot of people get to. They keep looking, 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 and at some point, they finally break down in the quiet of their own home and say, if you're real, God, show yourself to me. And God never lets them down. He will show himself. Because the scripture says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek me with... And he will never let you down. How many of you in here have gotten into a position in your life where you felt like, if I did not press into God, I'm not going to make it? And you know God as a Christian, but if you don't press in, you're not going to make it. And when you pressed in, you made it. Yes. He is waiting. He is waiting and wanting to expose himself through us. But are we bold enough to walk up to somebody if he says, hey, you see that person, you need to go up to them right now, and you know, he starts leading us. Are we bold enough to do it? This world is our playground. I hate to say it like that, but it really is. It's our training field. It is our training field. Everywhere we go, it's amazing. I would not have met Susan Barone 
had I not been hearing God. I went into a, um, I was a car, Jiffy Lube, and I was getting my oil changed, and she was sitting there. Did I just say that? Oil? Did I just say it like that? That is weird. Oh, I was getting my oil changed. And I look over, and here's Susan Barone, and she's got this book opened up, and it's about the vine, vineyard, something, and it's about fruit and the life of a Christian and all. And in me as the teacher, I have been known to do this. Yeah, Deborah knows. I'm going to test her and see how bold she really is. And so I said, acting like I'm not a Christian, not really knowing anything, and I said, hi, you know, my name is Michelle, nice to see you. What are you reading? Oh, my gosh. She didn't stop talking the whole time we were there. She was so full. She was so full. And she just kept talking about the Lord and, and about being a missionary and her dreams of going overseas. And now I don't know what country you haven't been to. I mean, God put that in her heart to the point where all we had to do was just ask. And it was right there amazing, just awesome. How ready are we when someone comes and asks us a question? Are we ready to just tell them all about Jesus? Or do we know whom we believe in? There's a scripture I'd like to talk about in Peter. First Peter, and you can put this up there on the board if you don't mind. I do have scripture with this teaching, by the way. About 300 and some odd scriptures. First Peter 3. And we're going to look in verse 14. I am super excited. I just cannot even tell you how excited I am. Can you tell that I'm excited right now? Because every day I have an opportunity to be around someone who is not saved. Someone who does not want to know who Jesus is. Doesn't even... Care. We're around people like that every day, but do you know who they are? Pray for these people. They're very, very much on the heart of God. 1 Peter 3.14 But even in case you should suffer for the sake of righteousness... All right, folks. Suffer for the sake of righteousness. We're not talking about suffering because you went off on somebody and cursed them out. Was that righteous? But even in case you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and happy to be envied. Do not dread or be afraid of their threats. Are we afraid of what people are going to say if we start talking to them about Jesus? No. Nah. Nor be disturbed by their opposition. Next verse. Verse 15. But in your hearts set Christ apart as holy and acknowledge him as Lord. There's our key. Do we acknowledge him as Lord, or are we still doing it our own way? Do we want... Okay, here we go. Frank, please forgive me. Got to do what God's showing me. All right. You're going to follow me wherever I go. Come on. Oh, I won't. I won't jerk you. Are we willing for someone to lead us around like this? Do you see he didn't even hesitate? He didn't even hesitate. I'm going to take you for a run. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are we willing for someone to lead us like this? Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome, Brad. Are we willing? Oh, psh, I'm not going that way. I don't want to go over there. But that's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants us to do, is to follow him. Look for that opportunity. Watch for that opportunity, that open door, that one thing. Someone drops a piece of paper as they're walking out the door. Oh, here, let me get that for you. Hi, nice to meet you. Some, any moment that we have that we can actually minister to someone to reach them. And I will fix that. Thank you. Acknowledging him as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical 
defense. Let's read that together. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope that is in you. But do it courteously and respectfully. Logical. Logical. What I just shared with you about the chances of finding that one silver dollar is a factual, evidential thing that rocks so many people's world. Like, what? Know some of these things. Guard your, I mean, gird yourself is the word I want to use. Gird yourself up. But it's not all about the knowledge. Don't misunderstand me here. It's not about just sucking up all the knowledge of the world and filling it in your head and thinking you're the best because you know something. Do you know him? Because my sheep know my voice. Do you know his voice when he speaks? And I am not trying to bring condemnation on you if you don't hear his voice. But I'm challenging you. If you say you are a Christian and you believe in God, by all means, you need to ask him to speak to you. The people in this world will not understand it when you say, oh, God spoke to me. (laughs) What? (laughs) Nice to meet you. But when you start sharing what he speaks to you and it changes their life, it's awesome. There was a day... Pastor Bob and I were standing up here. It was after service, and you know how we all like to come up here and talk with Bob. And I went up there, and I was just standing there, and he's looking over the congregation with a big grin on his face, all happy, you know, looking at everyone. And he says something along the lines of, and and not these words, but look at what, what God is doing in the lives of these people. Wow. And and he's looking and he sees this person talking with this person and this person ministering to that person and laughter and and leaders involved and and engaging with one another. And he's like a proud daddy standing up here. And in that one moment, I heard the Lord say, Pastor Bob's going to be on TV. And I went, okay, Lord. And I knew it was him. I knew it with every fiber of my being, but I did not know what was getting ready to happen. That next week, even, he was approached by Raul Infante and these people about going on TV, and he was starting to struggle with that thought, like, oh, man, I don't know if I really want to do this to get up in front of everybody. I'm happy right here where I am. Am I wrong? (laughs) I'm right happy up here. But had I spoke it, in the timing that God gave it to me, he may not have gone through that, oh, you know, maybe this is this God, is this not God, and having to seek God and pray for God, all because I heard from God, but I was scared to death to tell my pastor what God said. Now, I'm not under any condemnation with this. God moved because he knows what to do. He knew what I was going to do ahead of time. Use the situation. Pastor Bob got out there and ministered to so many people. It was amazing. But my point is, when he speaks, we are to hear and move because then fruit comes forth and we could save somebody a whole lot of trouble just by simply speaking what God shares in our heart. And you know what I've been known to do too? Sometimes say, you know what? I really believe it was God that showed me this. But if I'm wrong, don't stone me, but this is what I feel like he's saying. And I just deliver the message, and I pray over it, and pray over it, and then God will bring it to pass or not. And then I learn, because all I want to do is obey him. What what message do you have for me? I'll give you that later. (laughs) (laughs) But we need to obey quickly. So, okay. How many of you in here, and be honest, you have wanted to hear from God, but you've struggled with hearing from God? I used to. Struggled actually hearing his voice and knowing if it was his voice. 
how many of you have gone past that and you, you're kind of like in that mode where you really think you know what he's saying now. I mean, you're still a little gun shy, but you, you know, pretty much tell if it's him. Okay. How many of you know without a shadow of a doubt when he speaks, that's it, and you got it? There's a couple of you in here. Yeah, sometimes it's like that. There are sometimes when he speaks, there's no guessing. All of us are in different stages of our relationship with him. Who is Jesus to you? Is he someone in a book? Is he someone in your head? Is he someone in your heart? Is he someone that leads you and guides you, protects you? Do you trust where he's leading you? Even if he took off running? Let's go to the next verse, verse 16. Because if he's running, you, you, you know, we got to stay right there. <laughs> and see to it that your conscience is entirely clear, unimpaired. Your conscience, unimpaired. There are people who feel so far from God right now. It may even be people in this congregation that feel so far from God. Where are you, God? They feel impaired because they want to believe or they want to draw close, but they're not real sure why they fill this gap. And a lot of times what happens is sin separates us from God. And we know we're doing things that we shouldn't do, so what ends up happening is we are the ones that are getting farther and farther away. And we may not even know what it is, but just pray and ask God, God, why do, you, why do I feel this, this void from you? And the next thing you know, as we draw closer to him, he starts drawing nigh to us. Because you know what? He's never let us go. He's always been there. We're the ones who went taken off somewhere else. But he's always there. And as we start drawing nigh, we realize that he's there. And he is wanting to open up. And next thing you know, you're as close as you were before, back with your first love. So, see to it that your conscience is entirely clear, unimpaired, so that when you are falsely accused as evildoers, those who threaten you abusively and revile your right behavior in Christ may come to be ashamed of slandering your good lives. So when we talk to, you know, Mr. Joe Smith that walks in the door, and I just picked that name randomly, that is not somebody I'm talking about. Yeah, I do know a, Joe, a Joey Smith, but that's not who I'm talking about here. I just, random name. If our conscience is entirely clear and unimpaired, and we're flowing with the Holy Spirit, and we're lead, being led by Him, when we are accused in that moment, we can stand strong knowing that our lives are in good standing with him and we will be able to stand against those threats of the enemy through anybody. We don't have to get defensive. What, what, you say, what did you say that to me for? I'm, I don't got no time for you. And we start walking off because we're all mad and everything. No, keep your mind clear, a good conscience. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am walking and living and breathing in Him. I am led by Him. I am going to do His will. And it's not, it does not need to be a struggle. Oh, I got to do this, and I can't do that, and I got to do this, and oh, I got to obey this. That's law. That's a law mentality. People, that does not work. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about simply living and breathing, having peace in your spirit, being led by God, being listening, listening, putting our ear out and saying, okay, Father, I'm just grocery shopping. Okay, I'll get you know, just living and breathing. Everybody, do you all understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. I figured. I see a lot of nods. Let's go on to verse 17. For it is better to suffer unjustly for doing right if that should be God's will than to suffer justly for doing wrong. If someone's coming against you and, and, and we react to that person that's coming against us, we are now no longer acting justly. We are no longer acting in a right manner. And we are going to suffer more. 
in that moment. But if we maintain our composure and we love that person as Christ loves that person, even while they were yet in their sin, as he loved us while we were yet in our sin, then he can use us to reach people. Now that was a mouthful. That's when he can use us, is in the moment of us resting in him to carry us through it and not reacting in the flesh. So again, we're a three-part being. We have our flesh, we have our mind, will, and emotions, and we have our human spirit. Don't answer this question, but answer it to yourself. Which part of that is strongest in you? Your spirit man, your flesh, or your mind, will, and emotions? How do we hear from God in our flesh? Most of the time not, because if you heard him out loud speaking to you, you may not want to hear it again. In our mind? No, with our spirit man. So if you want to hear from God more, see where I'm going with this? Build your spirit man up. Stay in prayer. Stay in the word. Be around people that do follow the Lord in the spirit. Watch how they move with the Holy Spirit when they're going about their daily business. Call one of us. A day in the life of Michelle. Come on. Just come on. I have a lot of freedom in my job. I will have you walk with me the whole day. And I will do the best I can as I follow the Lord's leading to show you what it's about. And I mean that with everything that's in me. Because my heart as a teacher is for people to learn to grow in their walk with God. Not just do, 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 but actually be effective in what we're, we're put here to do in this world. Amen? All right. So this book, let me go back to this book again. Everybody take a deep breath. Woo! Forensic Faith. So I started reading this, and I thought, you know, this is kind of interesting because, you know, I wanted to be a detective when I was younger. Who is laughing at me? I really wanted to be a detective because I could literally walk into a room and assess what's going on that quickly and felt like it was a calling, like I could really do that. And as time went on, I started feeling like I wanted to be a teacher. And I didn't realize what God was doing, putting that desire in my heart to be a teacher. And then one day, and I'm going to start crying, It's just like the light bulb went off. And I was like, oh God, you've called me to teach. I don't want to be like a pencil that's shredded in the pencil sharpener. Here I am talking about something in the natural, in a spiritual way, as a teacher would. And then when I realized what I was saying, I'm like, ah! You know, start crying even more. Because me as a child growing up, it was not my goal to stand in front of anybody. I was on the back side, you know, sitting in school, doing my work. I stayed to myself. I, did, I was not the talker. I was the one that was considered the, um, when I was in high school, I was considered the preacher girl. So I was quiet, and then I went to high school and got influenced by others who were smoking, yes, Floyd, and started smoking, but I was still the preacher girl. Because anytime someone would talk to me, it was always something about the Lord or what he was doing. And they're like, hey, you got a cigarette in your hand. Yep. Got my issues just like everybody else. (laughs) But by the time I was 21, God delivered me from cigarettes. Wasn't a problem after that. Haven't had one. Don't want one. Matter of fact, can't stand to be around it now. I start (laughs) gagging. Can't stand it. Woo. So talking about forensic faith. There's three kinds of faith they talk about in this book. And and many of us have studied about faith and what faith is and and all that. But let's just talk about this. One of them is blind faith. Believing in something without any evidence at all. I believe. No evidence. We hold a blind belief when we accept a claim even though we are completely unaware of any evidence supporting the claim. So this man writes, 
My biological father is James David Wallace Sr. And I believe that he's my dad, even though I have no DNA results proving that he's my dad. I may be right about our biological relationship. I might be wrong. I only really know for sure if I were to perform a paternity test. In a similar way, blind faith can sometimes result in believing something that's true, but it can also lead to believing in something that's not true. So blind faith is blind. Now, many of us as Christians, we believed in Jesus blindly. We didn't have any factual evidence. We had no feeling in the inside. We just like, oh, mom and dad are serving God. I'm going to serve God. We all serve God. Everything's great. And we just go on blind faith, believing that's what it's supposed to be like. Did I say it was wrong? But it's more informed to do it a different way. Let's talk about unreasonable faith. Believing in something in spite of the evidence. This is called unreasonable faith. We might hold an unreasonable faith when we refuse to accept or acknowledge evidence that clearly refutes what we think is true. I'll give you an example. I liked to play with animals when I was a little girl. I didn't care if it was a mole, a squirrel, a snake. Yeah, all of them. Beetles anthills, everything. But the one thing that I was fascinated with that I got myself in more trouble over were frogs. We had a pond and there were frogs everywhere and at night I would open the window, you could hear them outside, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. Like how do they make that noise? It was just so cool. And so I would play with them. If I'd find one, I was like, oh, this is so cool. And he's peeing all over me. And I'm like, ah. And so my grandmother would say, put the toad down or you'll get. <laughs> Unreasonable faith. Believing in something in spite of the evidence. It's not toad urine that causes warts, folks. It's a virus. It has nothing to do with toad urine. But we believed it because our grandmother said it. That's unreasonable faith. We're believing it, even if it's not true, but we're believing it. Touching a toad is not going to cause warts. Now, I did have a wart, but it was not because of the toad. And I prayed over that wart, and that wart went away. Pastor Bob and Susan know about the, their daughter who also had the same thing happen. How about forensic faith? Now we're talking about forensic faith. Now here I am, I'm all excited about this book because it says forensic, right? The detective in me. The adjective forensic comes from the Latin word forensic. Forensia, I think it is what it is. Which means in open court or public. The term usually refers to the process that detectives and prosecutors use to investigate and establish evidence in a public trial or debate. Forensic faith is a faith that believes in something because of the evidence. We hold a forensic belief when we believe something because it is the most reasonable inference from evidence, even though we may still have some unanswered questions. We still may have some unanswered questions. Now, that whole thing about eight prophecies being fulfilled is part of forensic faith. Believing and knowing and acknowledging that there's no way they could have possibly known all these facts about Jesus way back then. So who is Jesus? He's everything that he was prophesied to be, folks. Not just those eight prophecies that are prominent, but all 300 and some odd prophecies. We may still have some unanswered questions, just like they do when the detectives go in and they start digging up things and looking to see what happened in a situation. They still have unanswered questions. However, there are facts. There is evidence. 
This guy says, I believe, for example, that amoxicillin can help fight bacterial infections. It's a fact. They've proven that amoxicillin can help fight off bacterial infections. So he believes if he does have an issue and he prays and the healing doesn't come right away, and I mean, he really needs to have something to take care of it, he'll take the amoxicillin and the amoxicillin gets in there and does what it's supposed to do. Okay. But he still doesn't know how the drug works. He doesn't have all the facts, but he knows enough to know. So my question is, what do you know about Jesus? Remember, I asked my kids this. What do you know? Write everything you know about Jesus. Are the facts you write things that you've heard as a kid growing up? What your parents taught you? Or the things you write have to do with your own personal relationship with Christ? He is my healer. He is my deliverer. He is my best friend. He's the one I follow every day. He's the one I pray to when I'm sad, when I'm happy. He's the one that I introduce to my friends because I'm in love with him. He's the one I talk about and people don't want me talking about him because they're tired of hearing me talk about someone I'm in love with. You ever been around somebody like that? Who is Jesus to you? And so my challenge to you today is, get alone in that quiet place and ask him to reveal himself to you in a way you've never seen him before. And he won't let you down. He will show himself to you. Jonathan, can you come here a minute? I got a lot of forgiven to ask today, apparently. Please do not be offended by this, folks. I'm only doing what I feel like God wants me to. Get up there, please. Do it parkour style. Eh? You're not going to do eh? All right. You're fine. So, do you believe if I grab a hold of your hand and jerk you off that step that you're going to come down? Possibly. (laughs) Are you going to stop me from doing it? Possibly. Why would you stop me? You don't want to get down off the step? So I'm going to take your arm. You're not going to resist. And I'm going to pull you off that step. How easy was that? Easy. All right, now get back up there. Don't let me pull you down. See what he's doing? Resisting. He's resisting. He's going backwards. All right, now stand still on that step. Here's Jesus. I'm Jesus. And I'm trying. You can go with it. I'm trying to lead him, and he can go easy, or he can resist and pull away from me. Now, at some point, we go so far back that he's back, and he falls. So what happens when he falls? Jesus comes back. And he doesn't leave him there. Don't ever feel like you've fallen so far that Jesus can't come pick you up. I've been in far places, folks. And he has never left me there. Now, there's one thing that I was going to mention, and it's way back here in the middle of my notes, and we have a couple more minutes, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Bob, because I know he's, like, chomping at the bit. He's got something to say. I see the... Yeah. There are two main religions in this world. Two. Christianity takes up about 31.2% in this world. Second one is Islam at 24%. 24. So, here's the deal. Do you know anything about what's in the book of Islam? The Quran? Do you know anything about it? I I didn't either until a few days ago. I just knew, hey, stay away from that. That's all I knew.
The Bible's the Bible. <laughs> Did you know that in the Quran, the most talked about figure? Jesus. The most talked. Do you know in the Quran, they actually say that Jesus was born of a virgin Mary? Yeah. Do you also know that in the Quran, it talks about Jesus as a pure boy when he was young. In their theology, they also talk about how many miracles he performed. Several of them are mentioned specifically. They also talk about prophets that we talk about and they're in our Bible. They talk about Jesus going about delivering people from demons, folks. Is that something we're going to dig up and say, oh yeah, we gotta follow that now too? No, not necessarily. But the point is, Jesus is everywhere in these manuscripts. And we as Christians have gotten to the point where we're like, hallelujah. All right, and I know you got some Medea folks out here. That was kind of funny. <laughs> we follow the Bible because that's what we believe is the manuscript that God gave us through the men as they wrote. But can I tell you, there are others who were led by God. Do I say go and read that and, and suck it up? No, but I am saying that there are books and books and books and books. The world can never contain enough books about them. Do you remember that scripture? There are other books that talk about him. Do not be afraid to share your faith. Do not be afraid to talk about Jesus openly. We've got over 50% of the population of the world who has it in the books that they follow. So don't be afraid. The world is our stage. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you. Find out who Jesus is to you. Okay, don't go and be that person who's like, well, I'm loving my life. I'm doing what I want. I'm going to go party and carry on and act crazy if I want to. I don't want someone leading me because I can lead my life because I've got it together. And then when the door closes and you're sitting there by yourself, well, I don't want to call this person because if I talk to them, they're not going to understand. Or, and you feel alone. And you wonder why. The reason is because your first love is still calling for you. Come, follow me. My yoke is? And my burden is? He wants more of us. Why? He doesn't just want half of us. All right, so, so Floyd, we're married. If I said I only want this finger, I don't want the rest of you. I just want that one finger because that's the finger that he opens the door to let me in because I want somebody to open the door for me. So that's the only part of him I want. <laughs> he says don't pull it too hard. Do we want all of what God has for us? He wants all of what he planted on the inside of you. He wants to see it bloom. He wants to see it manifest and grow and reach the numbers. He longs for it. In his innermost being, he longs for it. He doesn't want us to be all worried about the cares of this world. It will bring you down. He wants to see the fruits coming forth and reaching other people because it excites him to have another child in the kingdom. Amen. Happy there's another baby. We need more babies in the nursery, but don't be in a hurry to do it, okay? <laughs> you know how excited Miss Susan gets when another baby's coming in? Think about it. He loves you just where you are. Who is Jesus to you? 
Amen? Amen. 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 You know, um, <clears throat> Jesus asked Peter, who do them dear folks see that I is? Well, some say you're a prophet, a great teacher. Peter, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, flesh and blood did not show that to you, but my Father in heaven. And if the Father hasn't showed you yet, you're still in darkness. But I tell you one thing, when he shows you who Jesus is, you'll come out of darkness. You see, many people don't want to believe. It's unbelief. They believe in something. Because you're going to believe in something. You're going to believe either the lie, the great deception that's coming on this earth, that is right here, right now on this earth, the great deception. Because you love darkness more than light. Check your heart. Very simple, it's not complicated. The Bible says examine yourself to see if you're into, into faith. The Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. Right now the Holy Spirit's operating and he's bearing witness right now. What is he saying to your spirit? Is he saying that you're a son of God or a daughter of God? Or if he ain't saying anything? See, when the Holy Spirit operates and moves in your life, you just know that you know that you know that you know. You might not know all the facts. You might not know about all the prophets. And I thank God when I read the scriptures and I, and I, and I read about all the prophecies that have come forth thus far i don't doubt anything of the of the prophecies that are about and are coming forth even today right now in front of, in our generation prophecies are being fulfilled right now not many people don't even know it because they don't read the bible do you know that you know that you know that you know that's just the way it works how do i know i love see susan been married 64 years I know it. I sense it all in my heart and my spirit. Amen. <laughs> See, we're, we're spirit beings. And we're so conscious of our flesh and the world around us. But there's a world out there we don't see, but it is real as this world is. Thank God for that word that you gave us. Because those that are still, you know, I wonder, get into the Word of God and see if these things be so. Right, right. Study that show thyself approved unto God a work, and lead it not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the Word of truth. Don't continue on in your darkness. Don't continue on your uh, unbelief. Now, you got a will. You could go that way if you want to, but we're encouraging you to go with God, and God will reveal himself to you. Every day, God reveals himself to me. Listen, we live and move and have our being because of him, not because you're so pretty and good looking, and I'm not doubting that. God is the source of everything. Susan may have walked with the Lord. She's been walking with God since she was 14 years old. I was 26 when I... When, when the Lord found me, I thought I found him, but he really found me. Because you see, he came to seek that which was lost. And if you don't know him, I tell you, you is lost. And, and you're going to go to hell. Well, nah, I don't like that. I don't like that either. But that's why Christ came, because you wouldn't have to go to hell. That, that, he says, I've come to give you life to give it to you more abundantly. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll seek it in education. Go ahead, education's fine. Don't be an education, educated fool. Because you see, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
Is there any fools in here today? Who quit being a fool? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll hear you. He's not deaf. God is not deaf. So let's just pray right now. Father, I pray there's anybody here that's just, just wiggling, wiggling here, wiggling there, going from doubt to doubt. Lord, let them get grounded and rooted in your love. Lord, you've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us your word. And your word is alive. Put a desire, I pray, in all of our hearts to spend more time in the word and more time with you. Yes, we know, Lord, you know we need time to go to work and do the things around the house and the yard. You know all of that. But, Lord, whatever we're busy with, we can be walking with you. If we're working in the garden, you're there. If we're at work, you're there. Wherever we may be, you're with us because you said in your word you'd never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we thank you for those promises. We just give you honor and glory. And if you're here today, you have never surrendered to Christ. I am talking about joining a church. I'm talking about making him Lord. Lord, if I will confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is he Lord? Because that's the way you walk in peace and victory. Father, I pray that each person would make that decision right now. And Lord, after I dismiss this congregation, if anybody needs to come up and talk to Michelle or me or any other leader or Sunday school teacher, let them feel free to do so. And get it straight in their life and begin to walk. Because you're coming back, Lord. And you're coming back for those that are looking for your appearance. And we thank you, Lord, we're looking. We thank you now for the grace and the mercies. For the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Lest any man should boast. We have nothing to boast about but everything to praise you for. For you did it. You put us in Christ and you put Christ in us. Which is our only hope of glory of heaven. We thank you now. We thank you for the food that we're about to receive now in the fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said. Amen. God bless you, and if you need to come up and talk to us.